Hey everyone, it's Jeannie here and today I have the honor of speaking with former NFL star and Fox Sports analyst, creator of the video series, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, Emmanuel Acho, who has a new book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man, that really has the content that we're looking for today with a message that's so needed. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, for chatting with me. Of course. Let me ask you a question, because I know you're a man of faith, um, and this is for a faith audience. Do you consider what you do, um, having these uncomfortable conversations with white people, with people from all over the, the world, the country, about the issue of race, do you consider it a service unto God or, or, or a call? Uh, I do, I, but I, I consider everything kind of that I do and try to do for a purpose as ministry, as, 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 as um, using my platform. I've told this and I told this to Oprah that this is my Esther moment, right? Mm -hmm. For such a time as this, um, because I believe God ushered me into this moment for such a time as this. It was kind of one of those, here I am, send me type of moments. I didn't seek this moment out. I wasn't asking for this moment, um, but I, the man met the moment. And I'm always like, God, why did you choose me? But I think, Jeannie, that everything I went through in my life was for this specific point in time. Playing in the NFL wasn't to make money. I think it was to in, in, integrate myself into a culture that I, culture I wouldn't other be in, integrated with. Going to a predominantly affluent and white college preparatory school, Jeannie, it wasn't to get a great education. It was to immerse myself in a culture that I otherwise wouldn't be immersed in. And so that is how I see this. I think God ordained all of this to use me for this moment. And he really is. I, I am literally moved to tears every time I watch one of your episodes, your latest episode, you sat down with police officers, the whole unit, and it was so powerful. I, I couldn't help but think the shift and the trajectory of what was happening in that moment, you sitting with them, even for that precinct, um, it was just really, inspiring. I saw you sit down with Pastor Carl Lentz and he said something uh, pretty interesting and we covered that where he says, you know, he thought that the church propagates racism. As a black person, as a black man, is that something that, you know, is that a predominant thought in the black person's mind, especially in this country when you go to church, do you think I'm also not safe here? Um, I would submit this. I would submit that the church doesn't do a good enough job um, to break racial divides. Let me submit this, Jeannie. There's a difference between diversity and inclusion. Diversity being invited to the dance, inclusion being an ass to dance, right? I think the church attempts diversity. All our doors are welcome. We're a multicultural church. We're a multi-ethnic church. We're a non-denominate where everyone is welcome because God loves everyone. But what are you doing within your congregation to promote inclusion? Because black culture is different than white culture and the black church experience is different than the white church experience. I know, because I go to both. When mm -hmm. I was in college, I would literally go to white church at 7 a.m. then go to black church at 11 a.m. <laughs> and I say black versus white church because as much as my dear brothers and sisters, black and white, want to act as though we have uh, diverse churches, we, we're missing the mark still in that regard. And so I wouldn't say that I don't feel safe or welcome. I would just say I feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. you, um, you took a lot of these conversations to your book and I, I can't wait to really dig into it. Um, I'm, I'm a minister, my husband's a pastor. So I think it's something that's really great for, you know, ministers and leaders to do with their people and just kind of, um, you know, cause I, I see even when you have a conversation with somebody that isn't black about the time that we're in immediately, it's like, you know, there's, there's they get uncomfortable exactly what yeah. you're saying. What are you really hoping happens uh, with this book? Yeah, well, I think in uncomfortable conversations with a black man, it'll do two things. One, it will expose you of your own naive, naivety or your own ignorance. And two, it will educate you on what you didn't even know. See, when you start having dialogues, Jeannie, 
you start to expose things that you didn't even realize were misconceptions. A dear pastor, a friend who I uh, have met several times, uh, a friend who I, I enjoy his work, he came out during a conversation about racism and said, talked about slavery and said it was a white blessing. See, until you start having these dialogues, you don't even realize that that's in your head or in your heart. Mm -hmm. So while so many people criticized him for that, and I could understand the criticism, I'm like, because if you don't have the conversation, then you live your whole life with that misconception. And so I'm hoping that my book will essentially allow so many of my white brothers and sisters who were great intended white brothers and sisters to now have direction because intention without direction is void and meaningless. Mm -hmm. So many white people specifically in the church, my white brothers and sisters, in incredible intentions, incredible, God fearing, love the Lord, praise Jesus, all that. But they just don't have the right intent direction, Jeannie. And I try to provide some direction as well. Love that. Yes, yeah, so needed. You know, I had a conversation with somebody I greatly respect, Dr. A.R. Bernard, about this, um, about just everything that was happening and racism and even in the church and all of that. And um, we immediately got flooded with messages and, and emails and all that about uh, promoting Marxism and all this stuff. So there is a lot of that going on. And, and truthfully, many of uh, white Christians hear Black Lives Matter and they, they get up in arms. Um, how, what do you say to that when it's being politicized this way or, or it's becoming something that's now a trigger? Yeah, I try to avoid triggers. Here's what I mean. I separate Black Lives Matter, the noun, from Black Lives Matter, the adjective. Black Lives Matter, the noun, meaning the organization. I don't ever talk about the organization. Please do, with you, with, do what you will with the organization. Research it, find out if you support it or if you don't. But let's talk about the adjective, Black people and their lives mattering. Because there's nothing that can be triggering around that. I don't get into all the nuances of politics because, Jeannie, people get distracted by politics. Yes. I'm just here to talk about life and life isn't necessarily politics. My life mattering, your life mattering, that's not political. Um, that's just humane. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's my plan of action when I discuss those. It's like, let's not focus, let's not be distracted. Let's keep our focus on truly making change and being a part of the reconciliation. Yes, and I've had this conversation as well where um, there are people who really don't believe that systemic racism exists. And I know you talk about it a little bit in the book. Um, I, 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 I heard something interesting that you said with your conversation with the police officers. You said proximity breeds care. And I, and I was directly affected by it because of where I grew up. Um, but I've had conversations with several people who really do not believe that it does exist. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and just even the concept of proximity breeds care and kind of mix, we, we have to start to mix it up. It's 2020, what are we yeah. doing? Well, I would submit this, since this is a, a kind of a, a Christian platform in which we're speaking on, several people don't believe heaven or hell exists. That mm. doesn't necessarily change the existence of it. I'm like, my <laughs> personal belief on something doesn't change the existence of a fact. It can change an opinion, but it, change, it doesn't change the existence of a fact. So to my, to my um, religious and Christian brothers and sisters, that's what I would submit. Um, but what I would say is very simple. Let's start with facts. In America, there are two ways historically, Jeannie, to acquire wealth. The first is through education. The second is through um, property. Well, Black people weren't allowed quality properties after the Civil War because of redlining. So they were thrown into ghettos, into, into districts in which they couldn't get financing. Okay, well now let's talk about uh, education. The second way, Jeannie, historically to acquire wealth in our great country. 50% of public schools are funded by property taxes. So if you didn't have property and your property funds education and the two ways in our country to acquire wealth are through education and schooling, how can you systemically acquire wealth? Uh, it, it, it's, it's very simple. And that's typically where I go when I talk about anything systemic. So many people say, well, Emmanuel, so, it, it, everything's equal now. That's not the case. Just take a drive anywhere into the Agreed. hood and you'll realize it's, it's just not the case. Agreed. Um, I got to ask you, do you feel exhausted that you have to feel a certain way? 
you know, with everything that we see that's still happening, because we've seen it in Philadelphia again, I think either this week or, or during the yeah, weekend. Yeah, last week with uh, Walter yeah, last, Wallace. Yeah. Um, is this exhausting for you to have to, in the midst of feeling what you're feeling, also have to constantly be explaining for the, the you know, the, those who don't understand how they should be caring about what's happening to the Black brothers and sisters around the world? I would say it is a worthy burden. Um, is it exhausting? It's, it's, it, I definitely don't have energy, but um, I would say that it is a worthy burden. Some burdens are worthy, some are not. Um, and this burden is worthy. In team sports, sometimes you have to carry your teammate um, while they're down and they'll carry you at one point in time. And right now I just consider the fact that I'm, just doing a lot right now, but it's for the betterment of our society. So I don't really have time to worry about my exhaustion. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to breed uh, reconciliation. It is a worthy burden. And what you're doing is making a difference for uh, your black brothers and sisters or people of color during this crazy season. We don't even know what's gonna happen you know, this week or what's to come. Uh, what do you say? You have such a gift at explaining and, and really bringing us all together. What do you say to them on how to kind of be that voice? Um, well, I would say two things. Number one, um, it's not your responsibility to educate your white brothers and sisters. It's not. But I would also submit this. I think it behooves us to educate those who are willing to listen. It's not your responsibility to. And I'm not going to put an increased weight on Black people who are dealing with so much right now. But I do believe that it is in our best interest if somebody is willing to listen, then I'm not going to be the reason that they don't hear. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, 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 where, that's, how I, that's how I take it. I, everybody, Black people, we're not one monolithic group with all things the same way. But my train of thought is very simple. If they're willing to listen, I'm not going to be the reason they don't hear. Mm -hmm. Last thing, your chapter, you end the book with how to end racism. Do you think that's possible? Uh, there's Christians who say this is a heart issue and that's a sin issue and sin is always going to be here. Um, let me speak to that. And I'm going to real. Uh, let me speak to that. I love my white brothers and sisters, but we can't sit here and say that it's not about race. It's about grace. It's not about skin. It's about sin. It is about sin, but it's also about skin. It is about grace, but it's also about race because sin is playing itself out in the skin issue. I would also submit this before I before I let before you let me go, or I let you go, whatever the case may be. I submit this. There are degrees of murder in America. First degree murder, genius, premeditated, second degree murder, genius, a crime of passion. Then you move down to involuntary manslaughter. It's not intentional, but it's still unlawful. It's not intentional, but it's still led to a death. So many of my white brothers and sisters, specifically my Christian white brothers and sisters, they're not committing first degree racism. They're not shooting black people. They're not committing second degree racism. They're not putting a knee in a black person's neck, but they do fall under that rung of involuntary manslaughter. See, they are killing emotionally their black brothers and sisters, and they're even unaware of it. It's not a matter of sin because he who knows what is right and doesn't do it, this is sin. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, do my white brothers and sisters know what is right? See, when the pastor uttered that slavery was a white blessing, to me, that's not a sin issue because he didn't know what was wrong. And to not know something is wrong and not do something is not a sin issue. To me, knowing something is wrong and not doing anything about it now becomes a sin issue. So I am trying to, with my book, allow my white brothers and sisters to know what is right. Mm. Because he who knows what is right and doesn't do it, this is sin. I'll end with an analogy. If I am walking in a door and I don't see Jeannie behind me and I don't hold the door, I'm not at fault. I didn't see you behind me. See, but if I'm walking in that same door and I turn and I peek and I now see you behind me, but I still try to scurry in that door and let it shut right after me without holding it open for you. Now that's a different issue because now that's a hard issue. And so in closing, I would conclude and I would submit to my white brothers and sisters, it's not, let's not use that it is a sin issue as a masquerade for the real issue. Let's understand the real issue. It's not currently exclusively a sin issue right now. Let's understand the real issue and then let's address both issues as we can. Thank you so much, Emmanuel.
I pray that everyone that sees this will get this book and educate themselves. I appreciate your labor. I appreciate you standing in the gap for such a time as this. You keep it on, okay, bro? Amen. Thank you, my friend.